Hi everyone, welcome to chapter nine, where we're talking about real and ideal solutions. And I'm excited to be getting to this chapter because of, so of course solutions are involved with most of biology. So we'll get to shift a little bit of our focus over towards biological systems starting in this chapter. That will intensify with chapter 10 where we get to electrolyte solutions. And then the rubber really hits the road with the kinetic section of the course and we'll get to see the very strong interaction that exists between biochemistry and physical chemistry. Of course, the contents of this chapter, as well as the next chapter and the chapter on batteries and all of kinetics applies to far more than just biological systems. For instance, we'll get to see at the very end of the semester how kinetics applies to nuclear reactions, including nuclear decay and chain reactions as well. Okay, these are the topics we'll be talking about today. We'll review a few things from last time. Then we'll see how ideal solutions are described by a new law, Raoult's law. It's an important one. Then we'll see how the chemical potential relates to solution components. Then uh, we'll also um, get to see how the mixing of solution will contribute to the free energy and the entropy. Then we'll get to a different sort of phase diagram that applies to two or more components within a solution and how that relates to a new rule called the lever rule. And then probably we'll get to these other topics once we get to later lectures. And these were the topics we saw last time. We saw the phase rule, which tells us for uh, the number of degrees of freedom that we have in a pressure temperature phase diagram, it's three minus the number of phases in that region of the phase diagram. We also saw the Clapeyron equation, which tells us the slope of the coexistence curves within the pressure temperature phase diagram. And we also saw the Clausius Clapeyron equation, which came from the Clapeyron equation. And assuming that we know the enthalpy of vaporization and a couple other variables, then we are able to find the vapor pressure or relate the temperature of a substance to the vapor pressure uh, above its liquid phase. Lastly, I want to review this concept that if two phases, uh, and for our purposes, let's assume it's a gas and a liquid phase are in coexistence, then their chemical potentials are equal. And one of the first ways I introduced this to you was with this diagram, remember, where we had the chemical potential of the gas, and then we had the chemical potential of the liquid, and they were coexisting right where the two curves met. And I didn't really explain very well why that is the case, but here I want to take a little bit of time to explain this mathematically. And this is going to require us to return to the total differential for the Gibbs free energy. All right, so the diff total differential tells us that dg, a, a teeny tiny change in the Gibbs free energy is equal to the negative entropy times change in temperature plus the volume times the change in pressure. But then we've also got the chemical potential of the two different substances. And let's say that it's a coexistence of the liquid and vapor phase. So it's the chemical potential of the liquid phase times the change in the number of moles of the liquid phase plus the chemical potential of the gas phase times the number of moles of the gas phase. This was a concept that I introduced to you in chapter six. So you may not have understood the chemical potential at that time, but if you need to review where this came from, then go ahead and take a second look back at chapter six. So let me just draw a picture of the system we're depicting here. I have a tank of pure substance. I'm gonna assume that it's constant temperature and constant pressure. So I don't know, maybe there's, maybe there's like a little piston in here or something that allows the, uh, allows the pressure to remain constant. And then we've got the liquid down there in the bottom, and then we've got the vapor up there at top, just uh, exerting some sort of vapor pressure 
in the gas phase right up there. Okay, so down here is the liquid. Up here is the gas or the vapor. So that means that dg is going to be equal to mu liquid dn liquid plus mu gas dn gas because we have constant temperature constant pressure so dt and dp both equal zero all right if we assume that the system is at equilibrium then that means changing the number of moles of liquid or changing the number of moles of gas either one will not decrease the Gibbs free energy, okay? And it's also worth pointing out that if I have a teeny tiny change in the number of moles of liquid, because this is a closed system, it's not exchanging matter, then the gas and the liquid are free to interchange, but the change in the number of moles are opposite of each other. If some small number of moles of liquid appears, that's because an equal number of moles of gas disappeared and vice versa. So if I make a little plot here, down here I might have the number of moles of gas, and over here I have the Gibbs free energy of the system. If the system is in equilibrium, that means it's existing down at a minimum somewhere of the Gibbs free energy. And remember how we find minima is by saying that the derivative is equal to zero at that point, okay? So that means that no matter how we change the number of moles of gas, the derivative or the uh, the differential for G is zero, because if we change the number of moles of gas ever so slightly, like dN gas, then the change in the Gibbs free energy is going to be equal to zero. So therefore. That is just like saying zero equals mu liquid, dN liquid, plus mu gas, dN gas. But of course, dN liquid is equal to negative dN gas. So that's just negative zero equals negative mu liquid, dN gas, plus mu gas, dn gas. Then I add this one to both sides. Or actually, I'll, I can, I'll just draw the arrow going over in that direction. Mu liquid dn gas equals mu gas dn gas. But those just cancel out. So that means that if the two phases are coexisting at equilibrium, mu liquid is equal to mu gas. So this is a, a subtle and a little bit complicated but very important argument. So if you don't understand this, then please ask on the discussion boards or please bring it up in office hours. But this is why when phases are coexisting, their chemical potentials are equal.